Kieran says here, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Uh, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. So we're going to be talking primarily about your book, Life is Hard, um, and perhaps a foray a little bit into midlife, which was the first one that I read. But first of all, can you explain to me and to your and to our audience how you got to be where you are? Well, that's a it's an open ended question. I grew up in in Hull in in England and uh, came to the U.S. for grad school. Did a Ph.D. in philosophy, and I'm now a philosophy professor at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And until maybe ten years ago, most of my work was pretty academically oriented. I work in ethics, thinking about how to live, but mostly I was writing for professional colleagues. And then, really, over the last ten years. I, uh, partly through having my own kind of midlife crisis, have started thinking about the ways in which philosophical reflection on how to live can be of use to people asking the kind of questions we ask our friends when we're, you know, at a dinner party wondering what to do about the kids and the aging parents and work and jobs and illness and grief and death and loss and the injustice of the world, can philosophy really speak to those questions? And I, I really hope it can. That's that's wonderful. So um, Life is Hard, which is the more general book rather than specifically about midlife, though there are some crossover areas um, which, which we'll get into. But um, I just wanted to quote something from early in, in that book, um, in Life is Hard, because it, it seems to me to sort of introduce very well the way that you look at this. To open our eyes is to come face to face with suffering, with infirmity, loneliness, grief, failure, injustice, absurdity. We should not blink. Instead, we should look closer. What we need in our affliction is acknowledgement. And I think this is related to your interest in Iris Murdoch, um, who talks a lot about attention, a philosopher I too love. But can you just um, explain a little bit why that's so important? I mean, for me, it really, it, it it's a, a, both about the consolation of taking seriously one's own experience and other people's experience, and about the fact that it's it's very hard to orient yourself in the world unless you're willing to look at it honestly, even the difficult things. There's an anecdote. I, I think I, in the book, I tell it in the second person, like this might have happened to you. Unsurprisingly, it, it's something that's happened to me is. But I, I remember myself when I in my callow youth dealing with a friend was deal, the, their kid was having developmental issues. And I immediately went into the mode of saying it's going to be fine. Here's what you do. And it was not reassuring at all. It was a, just a failure to be able to sit with the problem and acknowledge what was happening. It felt like a kind of denial or disavowal. And I think correspondingly, the willingness to acknowledge difficulty is already a kind of consolation that makes us feel less lonely and more connected, even before it gives us the orientation to start to think, how can I cope with this? How can I make the best of what might be a difficult situation? That's really interesting because you're suggesting that that acknowledgement to ourselves is is actually almost the first step to self compassion, and I think, and that's re that's really interesting because I always have problems with self compassion, but that 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 view of actually acknowledging it is consoling. Yes, yes, that's wise. No, I I find that myself, and I find that. Uh, it, it, it somehow it is often easier to do these things in relation to someone else than in relation to oneself. At least I don't know if everyone's therapeutic experience is, is similar to mine, but but an enormous amount of effort goes into allowing myself to be as sympathetic to myself as I try to be to other people. And it's something that just it's it's alarming how how uh, unnatural that that feels. But uh, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you about that. Um, and you also say in the same in the, the opening section of the book, a focus on living well rather than happiness. Can can you explain that? Yeah. So, I, I mean, this is a distinction that philosophers often draw using kooky thought experiments, where the point is to distinguish feeling happy as a, a state of mind from living well as engaging with the world and people around you in emotionally healthy ways. And so the thought experiment philosophers point to is we, we imagine someone who doesn't know it plugged into a simulation where what, what they're being fed in the simulation could be absolutely wonderful. And they feel great. They're, they're perfectly happy. 
but they're not living well. They're barely living a life at all. They're not interacting with other people or reality at all. They're just stuck in the machine. And I think it's very important when we think about how what we're aiming for in our own lives to think in terms of living well, not, not just happiness, in part because when we do that, it opens us out to something that's less self-focused. Because once you start thinking, I want to live well, I want to engage with the world properly, it's not just about how you treat yourself. It is about how you treat other people. And, you know, I mean, I think the same contrast comes out in more, more kind of down to earth things that people experience, which is, for instance, the, the unhappiness of grief. That's a case where I think most people will recognize that it, it's not a kind of unhappiness that's the opposite of living well. It's painful, but it's not as though our lives would be better and richer if we didn't experience the kind of attachment to other people that causes us pain when we lose them. So again, there's just a contrast between you know what your state of mind is and whether you're engaged with the world in, in meaningful ways. That's, uh, I, I warned you beforehand that I'd written out a list of questions because otherwise I go off on a tangent, but never mind, I'm going off on the tangent. Because sure. it makes me think, I think you mentioned the John Stuart Mill um, idea of I'd rather be rather be Socrates unhappy than a pig happy. And uh, because I, I think a lot about animal ethics and I've been thinking a lot about animal cultures and what's meaningful to animals, which you can, I think, begin to appreciate through examining their cultural differences between animal populations. And it made me think that actually, uh, you know, a pig being happy doing the things that are meaningful to a pig would actually be just as happy as Socrates being busy doing the things that are meaningful to Socrates, that those two things would be equally a life well lived if you're doing the things that are meaningful to you, whether they are snuffling up truffle roots or and tending your piglets or, you know, having dialogues with uh, very clever people, whatever's meaningful to you rather than just pleasurable is is key, isn't it? I think that's totally right. I mean, there's something, although it, it, in life is hard, I'm, I'm in some ways critical of Aristotle, this ancient Greek philosopher who's set the terms of much of the discipline of ethics as contemporary philosophers still do it. What I'm critical of in Aristotle is this his tendency to focus on perfection or the ideal rather than muddling through. But one thing I think he gets right is that his picture of what a good life for a human being is, is very much grounded in our animal nature, in the ways in which we are a certain kind of social animal. There's a certain kind of connectedness to other people that is part of our flourishing. And he's very critical of hedonism, basically, as a picture of what a good life would be. His picture is that if you live well, engaging with people in the ways you should, doing the best you can, if you're lucky, happiness will come as a byproduct of that. It's not that he's against feeling happy, but it's not, as it were, the primary or direct end. It's the side effect of, of, of living the kind of characteristic flourishing life for a being of your kind. And in that respect, it is, as you say, very much like what we might say about the flourishing of a pig or of, of any other kind of living thing. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm going to have to think more on that. Um, moving on to my proper questions. And one of the aspects that, that came out um, a, in the, one of the early chapters was about pain and living with pain. And that's something that I hope you don't mind talking about. You do discuss it in the book. Um, yeah. If you wouldn't mind just giving us a, a little bit of the story of your issues with with chronic pain and um, and how important that was in terms of your looking at the difficulties of life philosophically. Yeah, so I I started experiencing what in 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 retrospect has been quote diagnosed as chronic pelvic pain, which is one of those diagnoses that's like a name for the symptom. But when I was twenty seven, and it started with just sort of stabbing pain in my groin and the sort of sense that I need to urgently needed to urinate. But it turned out that I you know, discovered that that that. It was not really responsive to anything I did. It wasn't that urinating made it go away. It was just a kind of um, ongoing discomfort that would vary between something mild and unignorable, and then something kind of you know burning and painful that made it very difficult to sleep. The hardest thing for me is that when it's bad, it's very very hard to sleep. And uh, I went through, as many people with kind of chronic conditions like this do, a kind of cycle of urologists or cycle of doctors who uh, tried various things. And for me, uh, none of which have really worked. It's For me, it's a matter of living with it. And so it's true that 
the the idea of thinking about how to live a good enough life when some degree of suffering and difficulty is unavoidable is for me a sort of defining condition of my daily experience as, as it is for millions of other people who have, who have chronic pain conditions. And so I didn't want to write a book that was just about me or just about chronic pain. So one of the chapters is so tells this story. I wanted to use it as a kind of lever to think more generally about the place of difficulty in the kind of good enough life that we can aspire to. And there is a, a kind of a moment at which uh, that, that for me really defined this, that I, I remember at some point when I was really acknowledging, maybe we'll come back to hope, but I described it to myself at the time as giving up hope. I was like, this isn't going away, just give up. And I think in some ways that was liberating, but my initial reaction was sort of the sense of fury at the injustice of it. And I remember sitting um, somewhere, maybe outside a, a doctor's office, watching people walk by and thinking very bitterly, you don't know how good you have it being pain-free. And then pausing and realizing I had absolutely no idea what any of these people were experiencing. It could be any kind of hardship or grief or loss or suffering or poverty, any more than they had an idea what I was going through. And I think that moment for me, if I was going to say what was the, the defining moment that made me, that, that sort of frames the book, it's the possibility of switching from the kind of self-pitying response that I understand to one's own difficulty, to seeing it as a kind of connection with other people, a commonality that al allows you to see other people and, co and feel compassion for other people and their, their difficulties. And that's, well, it's interesting, actually, I don't have chronic pain, but I have suffered from depression. And when I was reading oh, yeah. one, of the, one of the sections um, you were writing about in about, in, about pain, um, you say, um, although I'm not always in notable pain, I'm never aware of pain's onset or relief. By the time I realise it has vanished from the radar of attention, it's been quite a while. When the pain is unignorable, it seems like it's been there forever and will never go away. I can't project into a future free of pain. I will never be physically at ease. And that's very much the experience that I have in a in a depressed in a depressed state. That um that the past and the future is utterly compressed into the present moment in a in a way that no no meditator would particularly be seeking that suddenly the, the present becomes this interminable um unpleasant state that you can't imagine a way out of yeah that's really interesting i mean i was hesitant in some ways in that chapter to generalize beyond physical pain to kind of emotional pain but i do think there are these deep commonalities between them and you know i have dealt with depression at times also and I think your your description is exactly right. There's this sense that um, it feels inescapable in in the in the midst of it, and uh, and yet, I mean, this is part of what's funny about the, the physical pain too. Is that it? I will sometimes notice that I've had a good week, as it were, and be like, "Oh, it's funny." Uh, I hadn't really realized because it, it just will the, the the manifestation of things going well is that it's not really bothering me. And what, what I, I make a kind of slightly tongue in cheek comment about this in the book that, it, you know, trying to appreciate being pain free, this is like the, 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 the final insult is that when you're in it, you think, oh, the day when I'm not in pain, I, oh, it's gonna be so amazing. But in fact, you don't appreciate it because it's like kind of, turn, I say, turning on the light to see the dark, like that once you're not in it, the absence of it seems completely routine. So that's part of the challenge is, is to, uh, you know, is it, I don't know if it really works, but I think if you're not in pain, the exercise of just reminding yourself, like, this is what it feels like to not, to my body to not be disturbed, to not be drawing attention in this way. Um, if we could really appreciate that, I think we would feel a lot of gratitude for our lives. There's two, that makes me think of two things. One is um, Benatar, the antinatalist philosopher. I didn't yeah. read the book Antinatalism, but I read the book that was basic, that was kind of saying, well, dying would be better. And, you know, being something of a miserable person. And one, that was one of the things that he mentioned in that book. <laughs> we, we notice when we're in pain, but we don't celebrate the absence of pain. It just it just it sort of like doesn't hit any sort of like red light of, oh, this is worth paying attention to. But one of the things that I have found very helpful to me, my mother always used to say when I was little and I, I, 
I didn't really realize, but I think she pro she suffered with um, with depression, amongst other things. And um, she used to say, darling, this is a golden moment. You must always remember this is a golden moment. And I it was something that I always found quite beautiful. Sometimes I found it quite embarrassing, but uh, <laughs> when you're 13, but I but after she died um you know it, it, that did strike me as something um you know as something rather lovely and an ex-boyfriend uh, 10 years after we'd split up he said I still think of those golden moments and I find myself doing that so you know the Robin's song in the morning is so beautiful and, and I do try to clock it all of the time I try to clock these little things and I do think that that turning you know the small stuff into golden moments is probably as important as, as anything else to my, to my self-treatment. No, no, I think there's real truth in that. I mean, it, it's interesting that, that philosophers often talk as if when they're thinking about how, what it is for life to be going well or badly, as if pleasure and pain are just symmetric. But I think in, in all kinds of ways, they're really not. And that, you know, pain and why pain is bad is also, it's just a much more complicated question than philosophers often suggest. You know, often what, what they'll say is, you know, pleasure feels good. Pain, it's just bad in itself. But in fact, I think that appreciating pleasure is quite hard. <laughs> Experiencing pleasure in, in the kind of ways you're describing takes attention and, and work. And similarly, part of why pain is so bad is the way in which it draws attention and gets mm -hmm. in the way of experiencing good things. If it was just the pain, but you could also pay attention properly to all the good things happening, Eh, it wouldn't be such a big deal. But the problem is that it 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 gets in the way of the smooth interaction with other people or the world around you, and that's that goes beyond the fact that pain in itself is sort of a regrettable thing. Yeah, I think I think you're completely right, and 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 yes, that is that is very interesting. In it is that in in the book um, is the sense of that that feeling of connection with other people the biggest lesson you got out of it or did you feel that there were other ways that philosophy helped you to to deal with to deal with pain because I imagine that like you said there are millions of people who who suffer pain to some degree or another on a very regular basis and I think it's one of the hard cases in some chapters so like the chapter on loneliness or the chapter on grief I, I'm in a position to say here are things you might do that might help in the case of pain, it's so personal, and often there isn't that much you can do that it's hard to really give advice. And philosophy isn't really going to be an anesthetic. I, I, I think the two things that for me made the biggest difference were writing about it and communicating about it. In fact, even before I communicated to anyone else, when I was just writing the book, simply articulating to myself what was happening, sort of giving intelligibility to what otherwise seems like a, a, a a simply difficult experience that can be a kind of way of coming to terms with things and, and grappling with them um but then sharing them with other people and feeling like you're you're doing something to to take away the shame of certain kinds of conditions you know chronic pelvic pain is not the most glamorous of the pain conditions and i feel like yeah i'm, I'm glad to be able to talk about it and have other people who might be not wanting to talk about it think ah yeah that guy someone's out there you know sharing their experience with this the other thing has to do with the experience of the present in a way that connects to something you were saying earlier which is that you know it's a kind of banal thing but i think there's a deep philosophical truth behind it which is that um if you can live in the present pain is much more manageable like one day you can have a pretty good day with some degree of pain and if you just think well it's one day after another. It will be okay. It's these. It's the way in which it changes your relationship to the past and future that make it most difficult. And so I think a certain kind of practice of focusing on the present, um, which many people dealing with chronic pain already have meditation techniques for and so on, I think that has a deep philosophical uh, uh, kind of, there's a deep philosophical point there about the, the distorting power of pain and other kinds of suffering on our, our temporal experience. Yes, I, I, I started reading um, Scary, Elaine Scarry's book on pain, but it oh, yeah. was, I, I, I was it, my intellect wasn't quite good enough to to sort of like follow through. And I can't remember whether she talked about the temporal change of of pain. Um, did, I, I, it, she she must have because it is very, a, a very deep and and rich work. So it'd be interesting to find out if other people have commented on that. 
Um, you're talking about the moment, so I'm going to go on to the question about um, the moment. And I absolutely loved, and I came across it first in um, in midlife. Um, but you also talk of it in life. Life is hard. The distinction between telic and atelic activities, and that to me was that that really really struck me, and I found it a very helpful distinction and a way to and a way to um, sort of chart my days and to ensure that I was focusing on those atelic activities. So if you could explain that for people, I, I think that's really useful. Sure, yeah. I mean, so this is, the, the terminology comes from linguistics where it's used to apply to verbs and I sort of transpose it to the activities that the verbs describe. But it also comes from the Greek. So telos is the Greek word for end. And so a, a, a telic or telic activity is one that has a kind of final end point. So it might be walking home, or it might be getting a promotion, or it might be recording this interview, where at a certain point, you'll be done. And there are many worthwhile telic activities, things worth doing, but they have a kind of internal structural problem, which is that when you value uh, an activity with that structure, a kind of project, what you're aiming at is always in the future. There's the thing you don't have yet. So there's a certain kind of frustration that it's not here. And then as soon as it's done, it's in the rearview mirror, and now you have to move on. And what you're doing by engaging in it is taking this thing that's sort of a meaningful part of your life, and your way of engaging with it is, as it were, to sort of check it off, like get that done. And there's something self-defeating about that. And I think it's important to recognize that not all activities have that structure. It's not not everything we do has that kind of endpoint bring into it, but built into it. There are also atelic activities which well, don't have that structure. Things like just going for a walk or parenting or talking to interesting people where there's no point at which you're done and there's no more walking or no more talking or no more parenting. These are open-ended. And because they're open-ended, they don't involve, when you value that, you don't uh, experience the sense of frustration that what you care about isn't here yet or is over and in the past. If what you want is just to be you know, spending time with your kids and you're spending time with your kids. Well, that's happening. It's right here. It's right now. It's not It's not the end goal of a, of a project you're engaged in and that you hope will one day come to fruition. And I think there is a very strong tendency, both uh, in our internal approach to life, but also in kind of the st structural conditions that shape how we think about our lives to really value achievement projects and to structure our lives around them. And it's not, as I said, that they don't, matter some really do matter but it's very distorting if too much of our attention is focused in this self-defeating one thing after another yes i think that i think i think that is wonderful and it did make me realize because of once you i think you i think you mentioned this is that something from iris murdoch the um you know one of the tasks of philosophy is to come up with words or descriptions for things so that you can then understand them and yeah. and that's and that a reading that really did work in that way for me to say oh that's why i like doing that recently the thing i really like doing is crawling around in the undergrowth doing things like looking for acorns that may or may not have been eaten by a wood mouse or a dormouse uh. or a shrew <laughs> <laughs> or you know or other th other things looking on the ground to see if is that a roe deer footprint or a muntjac deer footprint or these kind of things which you know kind of go back to when i was um you know 11 years old in devon um which is a very rural and um and in some places wild part of the southwest of um england and um, all of a sudden, I found myself investing a disproportionate amount of time in in sort of crawling about in the mud and getting scratched. And I realized that the thing that was so wonderful about that was that it it had no purpose <laughs> at all. Mm -hmm. it was it was pure play, but also with sufficient engagement. um whereas meditation for me can be quite difficult. yeah, uh, but there, what I find so wonderful and is that my mind empties out entirely of me and is completely filled with the world out there. And I wonder, uh, to me, the, uh, that idea of emptiness seems to work that way productively for me. So I'm emptied out and the world rushes in and that world kind of continues going after I'm after I'm dead, after I'm not there. It's this sort of like permanent thing, which also gives me... Um, 
some sense of not really fearing death because I'm kind of emptied out and what I am is filled with the world. Um, but it's filled with the world when I'm doing atelic activities rather than when I'm um, thinking, oh, I must finish this by seven o'clock or whatever it is. Yeah, no, there's so much there. I mean, I, I do think that that there's something very meditative about the activity you're describing, even though it's not it's not meditation, but it has this, this very similar character. And I think the other thing is, you know, I, I first started thinking about this when I was having this sort of midlife crisis where I felt like my relationship to philosophy, which was something that was originally AT, like I just loved thinking about and grappling with these questions and talking to people about them. And then I became a professor and, the, you know, the structure of, you know, get a promotion, get this article published, get tenure, the, get a PhD. It, my whole relationship to it had become project structured. And I do think there's something uh, to the middle of life that lends itself to that structuring that when you're younger, you know, when you're a kid, you may, you're less sort of structured by projects. Although I, now I think education increasingly early does start to push kids into to feeling like their life is about getting various check marks uh, on some CV. But but it's also, I think, this helps to explain why you get this U-curve in, in happiness uh, over age, where older people are surprisingly more satisfied with their lives than middle-aged people expect that they will be. And some of that, I think, it has must have to do with the, the releasing of the pressure to be constantly achieving, and that, that there's more room to, as it will, live in the present of these atelic activities. Yes, it, 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 it does feel, it does feel very, very freeing and, 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 um, and, and sort of quite, quite beautiful to me. Um, one of the aspects I was, and I was delighted to read um, about um, your, your sort of criticism of the narrative view of life. I think a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of interpretations of, um, life having meaning um have this sense that in order for your life to have meaning it must have this kind of like trajectory and everything must make sense in some kind of sort of seamless way and that's never felt i've never felt that 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 fitted me and um and i was interested to read your view of that where did that where did, how did the sort of like that come into the way that you were thinking about uh, philosophical ways to deal with life's difficulties well it was also it was connected with this sort of project driven structure but maybe at a larger scale of sort of thinking of your life as right. having yes. to be a success the idea that that uh there's a kind of life defining project and if and you can be a winner or a loser which is a kind of ideology that is destructive in many ways it's destructive in part because it's risky you <laughs> if you if you're seeing your life that way you may be you may be one of the losers but also it's a kind of blinkering it's a way of narrowing the range of things uh, in life that you can find value in. So the like looking around in the hedgerows, it's very hard to, to kind of fully appreciate how much that can mean in a life if what you're thinking is, well, what's the big story of which I'm the hero here? And and I think, you know, there's a very wonderful book that I, I, I mentioned in Life is Hard uh, by um, uh, a, a critic and an author, Jane Allison, called Meander, Spiral, Explode which is about the diverse varieties of narrative form. And I think one thing that I think is very liberating when someone, when people tell you about the kind of importance of narrative and telling your, your own life story to yourself is to remember that the simple linear narrative of there's a challenge, you set yourself a big goal, you achieve it, you've won, is one of, is one of just one of many, many different kinds of stories we can find satisfying. And mm -hmm. some are cyclical and others are scattershot and others are wave-like. And, you know, I think if we thought of the stories of our own lives in terms that allowed for that full diversity of stories, yeah, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have this, this uh, restrictive cramping effect that the idea of life as narrative has tended to have. And it's an idea that I think has really caught on in philosophy and psychology and in forms which are quite productive and then have a, a, a kind of carry on effect in in self-help and in people's ways of of understanding themselves what do you mean the the different views view has has taken off in no i mean i mean like no i i, th I think yeah. that the idea that it, when people talk about life as narrative it, i think that will be 
in itself harmless if we kept in mind the plurality of narrative forms, because it would be like, yeah, there's a million ways to make sense of your story of your life. I think the problem is that it's tended to be associated with this, the kind of linear trajectory, the heroic narrative. And uh, that's a story that it can, uh, it can be unrealistic, it can be limiting, and it can be sort of self-punitive in ways. It's not, I think, an enabling way to understand ourselves. And more than that, it's just optional. It's, there's no good argument in among any of the philosophers who talk about this, that that is the way to have a good life. It, it's something that that they're that they sort of, I think, fixate on because they don't have in view the a wide enough array of different kinds of stories. That's that's very interesting. Yes, because because I've come across it as I've come across it as beneficially put forward in some discussions of philosophy of psychology, and then utterly torn apart by Galen Strawson. <laughs> right, right, and, yes. And that and that kind of middle zone does actually strike me as as very interesting, particularly what you said about the idea of these sort of more scattergun um, approaches, because I, I tend to think of, well, you know, it's all about me. Um, I tend to think of um, of myself as having this more um, assimilating different ideas, going off on tangents and having this sort of scattergun approach. So trying to form myself into one into one strong thing has always felt both alien and as if I would be missing out on so much, however much potentially better I could be at a given thing through focusing all my attention on it. It seems like it would be too much of a loss of the other things that I enjoy. Yeah, right, right. It just limits the diversity. And I, that's a case where you, you might say, yes, we should re resist the idea of life as narrative, or you might say, look, a kind of narrative, a kind of story that we sometimes enjoy reading is the episodic story where there's a protagonist and they do a bunch of different things. And yeah, each each chapter of the collection of short stories, it's a it's, they're doing something else in some other setting. But that's a satisfying kind of story to experience. And yeah, that's a model we might you might have for a life or, a, you know, you don't even need to have that model. But but it, it it's. Um, it's at least much less restrictive than thinking um, this has got to look like a, a kind of Hollywood movie. And the way that you're talking about the, uh, those other types of narrative that you could have, it might be easier in those other types of narrative to fit in experiences of loneliness and experiences of grief, because you're not expecting them to be the thing that is kind of like overcome by this point when the hero oh. goes valiantly mm -hmm. onwards. No, I love that point. I mean, I think grief is one of the cases where there's a very strong desire to fit the experience into a narrative to say there are five stages and you go through them in this order and you can check them off and you know where you are. And unfortunately or fortunately, grief really doesn't seem to be like that. Like the, I think the social science suggests that it's it's a, like a stress reaction. You're It's up and down. It's emotionally volatile. It's very different for different people. It's highly culturally variable. So yeah, that's a case where, you know, to 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 force yourself to try to think in narrative terms is sort of running against the grain of acceptance and acknowledgement of a kind of experience you're going through that just may not have that shape. Yes. And what you're said, what you've said right from the start about it, um, acknowledging and looking, paying attention to your actual life. If the thing that I always worried about with the narrative approaches to to psychology and say substance abuse or, or or something like that is that if you create a story where a person feels that, you know, this is how you become the hero, that it's very easy to, you know, well, I can't do it. But it's also very easy to try and sort of like fit different things into the desired story and to and to not actually be seeing honestly what you're what you're actually doing because you're trying to tell a story that matches the story you've been given or the story that you want to tell and it can then i think maybe be harder to have that um to have that sort of honest acknowledgement yeah no no i think that's right I think there's risks of self deception there and risks of misconceiving other people and not really seeing them attentively because you're trying to immediately map them onto a narrative or map a narrative onto them in order to sort of get them pegged, right. get them like sort of just just tape down exactly what's going on with them. And it does run counter to the kind of openness that I think is 
is um, part of genuine intimacy, really. And part of maybe genuinely engaging with with life in that way of living well. Yeah. You you did talk about um uh, about loneliness and about um and about grief and I think that you know loneliness um I I've, I've sort of come across um I think there have been recent books uh, about the sort of like rise of loneliness an epidemic of loneliness did we not have an, a loneliness czar in the United Kingdom at one stage there I was think... a minister of loneliness I mean, there may still be I haven't yeah but but yeah. yes that's right there was a there was a report was commissioned yeah yes. So, so loneliness is 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 something um, that is is sort of clearly current and of concern, and I think that in a lot of a lot of cases of um, a lot of cases of um, even very sad conditions of suicide or or, or um, substance abuse, that they that that loneliness may be one of the real pains that people are that people are trying to trying to deal with. Um, how did you feel that um, that philosophy could help you work with that? I mean, this was a case where the the philosophical thinking about love and friendship and loneliness and the, the kind of psychological work on loneliness really seemed to kind of, although actually developed independently, really seemed to run in parallel. And part of what the what they suggest is that, you know, love it, what part of why love matters to us it's a kind of, is that it's an appreciation of our meaningful existence our dignity as human beings it's the same kind of value that's recognized in love a kind of unjudgmental unmeritocratic appreciation of someone just as they are that's actually very continuous with just moral respect with with ba being able to acknowledge someone else as having claims on you and mattering in the first place and what that suggests is that there's much more of a continuity between the kind of love that is hard to get to and basic attention to an engagement with others. And what it turns out is that the psychologists find is that when people are lonely, even very small amounts of meaningful social interaction can start to make a difference to their feelings of isolation. So there's a, there was an experiment where, in, I think this was conducted in Chicago, where people were, were given the, to, as, a, as an originally British person, the, the harrowing task of going up to a stranger on a train and asking them a, a question and telling them something personal about themselves. And what they found was that people were able to do it. And then they had this brief, meaningful connection with someone, and then they never saw them again. And they reported, improvements in their sense of connectedness and decreases in their sense of loneliness to a, a kind of an amazing extent after just one brief interaction. And I think that's because fundamentally what's at risk in loneliness and the absence of love is a sense that we don't really exist anymore, that, that our value is just completely disappearing from the world. And so I think you're right that at its extreme, that is the kind it extremely it's sort of um how to put this it's kind of profoundly uh disabling and kind of uh, it's understandable that people experiencing profound loneliness don't see any point in their existence it's very hard to to feel that they even really meaningfully exist um and that's a kind of you know that that's a vision of what's going on and also how modest how, how even modest steps can be a pathway out of it that i think is both suggested by the philosophy and confirmed when people when social scientists study loneliness yes yeah, like a, it's like a personal existential uh, existential crisis isn't it, it of, of, am, am i actually existing that is it makes you think of people disappearing into actually fragmenting into um fragmenting away into into their atoms due yeah. to that lack of that lack of mattering to anyone it's Yes, it's quite it's 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 a profoundly painful thought, actually. Yeah, um, no, and it, yeah. So no, sorry. No, I was going to say that. The, yeah, I mean, most of us don't experience anything as extreme as this, but the, the reports of people who've been in, for instance, solitary confinement, what they what they describe, the metaphors they reach for, are immediately ones of invisibility or just non-existence, and it is that's a harrowing way to experience oneself as not really being there anymore. 
I just read a read a novel by um, I think it's Martin McInnes. His his most recent one is called In Ascension, which was just fabulous and um, um and sort of blew my mind. And the one before that was Gathering Evidence, which was also brilliant. And this one was his first novel. Um, his name I can't recall, and I didn't enjoy quite so much. But the basic premise was a person who did who did basically just disappear and someone who was really sort of quite isolated. And I hadn't, and it, until you were talking about that, um, oh, that wow. sense of sort of not mattering to anyone, I hadn't really, because he's, he's, a, he's a deeply philosophical and, and also sort of scientific writer. So I'm, I'm sure that that awareness would have, would have been there for him. Um, and this, this idea connects back to, to Iris Murdoch's work as well, doesn't, yeah. doesn't it? Um, you 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 write um, as Murdoch wrote. The more the separateness and differentness of other people is realised, and the fact seen that another man has needs and wishes as demanding as one's own, the harder it becomes to treat a person as a thing. And what we're suggesting is that if you aren't, if you haven't got that that feeling of losing personhood and becoming thingness, can happen to you internally. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good connection to draw. And she, I mean, there, she's sort of drawing a connection, again, between descriptions that we might naturally attach to love, in a kind of intimate love, like deep attention to another human being, and ideas that we might associate with just basic justice for other people, namely acknowledging their reality, and seeing that there's a kind of continuity between those two, that they're not entirely separate phenomena that as soon as we're thinking about the, the value that we're responding to in love and in friendship and that we feel is neglected in loneliness is a kind of profound it's a moral value it's a value of of other human beings as moral beings as, as having dignity and that that connection is i think um another important way in which thinking about one's own difficulties, one's own loneliness, for instance, is a lever to thinking about other people and about the, the kind of connection and commonality we have with others. Yes, that, you mentioned injustice there. And um, and I was, um, I was, I was, it was really interesting that in, in a book where I think a lot of philosophers, when they write about um, philosophy as a way to navigate your route through life it's it there's a very personal take on it and you have expanded it into the realm of looking out at the world looking out at injustice and and what to do about it and I found that um I found that sort of you know morally um morally wonderful um but what led you to making that decision and what and where did the philosophy take you in in that subject I mean some of it we're kind of talking about implicitly already, which is that yes. I, I think that there's, um, you know, part of what thinking through one's own loneliness leads one to, or thinking about grief and loss leads one to, is the recognition of the value of other human beings who, in, in essence, are no different from the palpable, profound value of the person you love or have lost. And so I think there's a kind of continuity there. But also, I, I just think when, if, we, if we're thinking that the goal is not I feel happy, but I live well, I kind of live a good life, then we should already be thinking that part of living a good life is trying to do justice to the world around us, including other people. And, you know, at that point, questions about justice and what our responsibility for other people comes to are very hard to avoid. And they are, I think, very painful and very difficult. So actually, when people sit around feeling, at least, I don't know, I, I maybe I know too many do-gooders, but you know, when people sit around feeling agonized about their lives and feeling bad about themselves, sometimes it's, I don't have any friends, or sometimes they're in pain because they're in pain. Um, but often what pains people is seeing other people suffer or feeling hopeless about what's going to happen to my children's children and what's the future of the planet and yeah. feeling powerless to do anything about it. So it, it's not, I think, that the, I don't think these kinds of connections between larger issues of justice and our own personal sense of meaningfulness are, are really alien to, to most of us. That they, they are, people, people get depressed about the injustice of the world because they, it is part of paying attention to the world that one cares and is moved often in, in painful ways by what, what one sees. And so I don't think there's any quick solution 
to this that philosophy can offer, but I do think it can illuminate the idea that uh, that we do like what are, give us a sense of what our responsibilities might be and help us to understand why we're, we're so likely to feel like we're not doing enough and that that is not that's not a that's a sort of feature of our predicament that uh, we could always be doing more. We could always be doing more to help other people. We could always be more self-sacrificing. And there's no, even the people I know who spend their lives as climate activists have the same feeling. I could be doing more. I'm not doing enough. So I think trying to understand that experience in a way that is self-compassionate and not disabling, it doesn't make you just give up and throw up your hands. I think that's something philosophy can can help us with. In in I think it's in the same in the same chapter. You said something that I that I also thought was very interesting. Um, you write that it's doubtful anyway that we're in a position to conceive an ideal world, and that that did yeah. uh, that did sort of make me sit up and think. Yeah, no, I, I mean this is a debate that's been happening in political philosophy for the the last 30, 40 years. Is is people philosophers political philosophers pushing back against a certain tendency to think well political philosophy is about describing utopia basically mm. and then the, the next question is how do we get to utopia and the problem is that can be a very demoralizing political vision because the answer may well be i don't really see how we're going to get there yeah. and it may well be that the advice well just get as close as you can isn't actually the best advice for our current circumstance and so there's a kind of movement in political philosophy to think in terms of what gets called non-ideal theory, mm -hmm. where the idea is what we're better describing utopia is very difficult. Recognizing injustice here and now, something we're much better at. And a thing we can do is think about injustices in which we are entangled and the small collectives that we're part of that can make a difference on a scale that we that will be palpable to us and that we can make a difference in, and then act, act on those scales. And that vision of what sort of political engagement looks like and what political philosophy can help us do uh, is both something I'm interested in for its own sake in the, the chapter in the book about injustice, but also in a way it's a model for the whole book. In a way you could think of what I was doing in writing a book about how to live well that never leaves adversity out of view was saying something like, well, what would it be like if we said for ethics in general, for how to live in general, let's stop imagining a kind of utopia because it's not, we're not going to get there and aiming for it is not necessarily a good life strategy and start thinking, okay, well, what are the problems we're grappling with and how can we make something good or as good as possible out of grappling with those problems? So I think this shift in perspective is one that matters at a political level, but also matters at a, a personal level. Yes, that's that's wonderful. And it's connected to the idea of the virtue of hoping well as well, isn't it? Which is another lovely, lovely line towards the end of the book. What do you mean by the virtue of hoping well? Well, thank you. Yeah, no, so this was this connects actually to, to my description of my experience with chronic pain, where I think I, I became very cynical about hope. I felt like the hope was kind of torture, that every time I went to a doctor, I would hope for a cure and then it would fail. And that I thought the right liberation from this is to just give up hope. And so I went into writing a chapter about hope with a lot of ambivalence about it. I mean, I thought it was sort of funny in a way to have a, a, a book in which each chapter is about hardship in life, like, you know, infirmity, loneliness, grief. And then one of them is hope, because sometimes <laughs> I've experienced hope that way as a, as a kind of torture. But actually, I think there's a, a big shift here that we can make. And that for me was very profound from thinking should I hope or despair? Which is a kind of reaction you might have about something in your own life, or it might be you know, reading the news about climate change to oscillate between thinking disaster, yeah. we're doomed, and thinking it's going to be fine. And to think that isn't the right question. The question is always, what should we hope for? And there's always something to hope for. And in my case, I didn't give up hope about chronic pain. I shifted from hoping for a cure to hoping for a way to live well enough while this background condition was there. And so I think that shift, it puts into play the virtue you've just described, where we think, okay, I'm going to hope, it's a precondition of action. I'm not, it's not really a possibility to give up. 
The question is what to hope for. And the challenge is to hope for the right things, to, to be realistic about what you hope for, not to slide into wishful thinking, not to give in to despair, but to kind of maintain hope at the things that are worth hoping for and practicable enough that you have some chance of really, really getting there. And that shift from thinking about hope in black and white terms mm. to thinking about it in this more nuanced way, uh, I think sort of helped, helped me overcome or at least place my ambivalence about hope uh, and, and recognize that it, it still plays a very central part in my life. Yeah, so it's still, instead of having the hope for the ideal world, you have the the hope for the for the change that you can make at the level yeah. that you can make it. No, exactly, yeah. exactly. And you know, my I mean, the other story that comes to mind here was I remember when my my mother in law, who is still uh, alive and doing well, but was was exp she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer when now thirteen years ago. And you know, ovarian cancer, late stage, the life yeah. expectancy is not great. And I remember she described a conversation with her partner saying, I just don't know what to hope for. And he said, uh, hope for a good summer. And I thought, right, this was, for me, that was a really profound moment of thinking, she had no idea how long she was gonna live. And, but it, they could manage to go on vacation that summer and have some, she just got out of a round of chemo and. Yeah, could have a good summer. I thought, right, there's always something practicable to which one can attach hope. And trying to, the shifting from saying, am I going to be okay? Am I doomed? To thinking, well, what's next that I can act on is the, a, a, a liberating and enabling shift. Yes, that's beautiful. Um, you have a podcast. And the first question you ask your guests is um, from Iris Murdoch. Um, yes, the most yeah. important question you can ask a philosopher is what are you afraid of? So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> turning it into the last question, what sure. are you afraid of? <laughs> well, that that is a, a de depressingly easy question for me because what I'm afraid of, I'm, I'm one of the constituency of people who are so profoundly afraid of death that we find the the... The, the constituency of people who claim not to be profoundly afraid of death, like absolutely baffling. I feel like I, when I talk to, I don't know, what, what, do, you, do you know where you fall on? Are you, I feel I'm like it's afraid. bimodal. You're not, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not afraid of death at all. I'm afraid of dying. I'm, yes. I'm very yeah. afraid of the run up. I'm very afraid of sort of like, you know, being alone in somewhere and in, incapacitated or a uh, dreadful pain. I'm terrified of all that, but the actual death bit. The actual um, death. Yeah. No, it seems like people, people, they, it's like I said, it's bimodal. There's the people who are terrified by it and the people who are like, yeah, dying could be terrible, but death, no, that doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Um, yeah. So that's the thing I, I think I, I feel the, the, the most afraid of. And I, I've sometimes toyed with the idea of thinking I should try to write about it. Like often writing about things you struggle with is a good strategy. But I kind of feel like once I start writing about it, it's like, what am I going to do? Keep, keep keep writing about it until I solve the problem and I'm no longer afraid of death. I feel like that I'm not convinced that's going to happen. But uh, that that feels to me like a, a kind of philosophical problem that I wish I knew how to to grapple with. Yes, because in the in the chapter you you go through all the different constellations like Epictetus and is it Epictetus? Am I saying the right name? Epicurus. It might be, Epicurus. Epicurus is the one who says death. Death is nothing to us. Yeah. Yes, and then and then there's the the then there's beginning with L in the book that's got a name. In... Lucretius. <laughs> Lucretius on the nature of things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. On the nature yeah. of things. I knew it had nature in the title, um, <laughs> and I've I've come across those ones before. Um, but yes, you, so you go through various different, oh, and the Buddhist ideas as well and reincarnation. And you work through all yeah. of it towards the end of the chapter. You're going, you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> it doesn't work for me. Well, that's true. That's the, the, that's a cha I think it's the chapter on death in midlife where I say, look, I'm going to tell you, the reader, some of the philosophical consolations for it. I'm not going to pretend they work for me, but hey, why would I deprive, if, if they work for you, I have no objection. But um, but no, it's it's not a problem I've been able to, to really solve. 
No, I will. And nobody has solved the problem of death so far as I know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it remains. So you're in good company there. Um, oh, so yes, that was in midlife rather than in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I come back to it a little bit in, in this book. Where in the chapter on grief, I talk a little bit about death and and whether death is bad for us and, and sort of ancient Greek philosophers and Roman philosophers who've argued that grief doesn't make sense because, you know, death isn't bad and you mm. knew people were mortal to begin with, so get over it. So th there's a certain kind of um, uh, dismissiveness towards grief that I, I push back against there. But yeah, the, the, it's continuous with this discussion in the midlife book about, about mortality. So is there, oh, you, I did w want you to show um, Life is Hard because you oh, yeah. a Yeah, yeah, I have, a, I have a copy in front of me. Although I think this is the American edition. The British yes. edition looks slightly different, but pretty similar. Um, yes, yes it, looks, so. it looks a little bit different on Kindle as well. But, <laughs> but yes. it's, it's a wonderful, it's very, very readable and um, as is midlife. And they're not massively, they're not massively long books. No, no. They're, yeah. And beautifully written and, um, you know, just a load of ideas that you know, that really do set you thinking and wondering and, um, you know, and make your life more meaningful just to read them. So I highly recommend them. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Is there is there anything else for, that you'd particularly like to bring up? And and certainly, um, you know, are there are there ways that people can get hold of you or follow you I, on Twitter and so forth? I, I, I should do the plugs. I mean, I'm, I'm still on Twitter. I'm not sure for how long, but I also I have my website is, is, is ksetia.net and if you google me i'm easy to find and i have a substack newsletter that is about whatever i'm thinking about in a given week i try to write something and that's called under the net it's an iris murdoch reference uh -huh. uh, the name the title of her first novel um and yeah some of it is philosophical some of it's just whatever i'm reading and you can subscribe to that if you just look for me on substack did you say that under the net you thought was her best book I do think that, yeah, it's it's my favorite of her novels. I mean, it's it's a little bit uncharacteristic, but it, it's very it's sort of a funny, picaresque adventure novel, not like the big, the giant philosophy heavy ones that come later. But um, yeah, I might look that out then. I might I might follow your recommendation. And um, and what are you working on now? Well. I'm working on various little things. I'm I'm now department head, which is not an exalted position. It's more of a, a an arduous administrative position. So <laughs> lots of my time is being sucked into to running things and trying to 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 uh, make my department run well. I I have been thinking that at some point I'm going to write something about philosophy and comedy and comedy as as a kind of consolation. But it's still just a twinkle in my eye at the moment, maybe maybe in a year or two. Well, we'll look forward to that twinkle reaching its, few, um, its fruition. Kieran Setia, thank you so much for joining us on Shrink Wrap Radio. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, a pleasure for me too. Thanks so much for having me.